I think we should be good to go. Good to go. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to thank you so much for uh, attending the webinar this afternoon. Um, this is the second legacy webinar that we've held for Earth Month, and actually the first time we've done this program during Earth Month. Um, legacy, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is a nonprofit environmental education organization. Um, we were founded in 1992. Um, and our, our mission is to provide balanced and fact-based environmental education to the citizens of the state of Alabama. Uh, we do that through a lot of different programs. Our primary function that we do now is teacher workshops and we've been doing quite a lot of those in person up until COVID. Um, and so this summer we've already done one that was very successful. It was a week long program called Mountains to the Gulf. We did it virtually for the first time this year. Um, and David Matson, our educational programs coordinator, um, and several other of our board members and other volunteers from other environmental organizations hosted that and it went really well. So we decided to try doing some virtual webinars. Um, I hope that we can get back to the in-person teacher workshop perhaps this summer. Um, as everybody knows, everything right now is just dependent on how COVID continues to hopefully improve. Um, if that doesn't happen, we do plan to offer some workshops this summer virtually. So you'll wanna, um, if, you, if you're not a member of Legacy, you can join by visiting our website. Or if you uh, can't join at this time, you can always go there and sign up for our email so you can keep up um, with what we're going. And we also are on Instagram. Um, some other things we offer, um, we just got through offering our annual grants program where nonprofits and schools can apply for a grant of up to $2,500. Um, we awarded nine grants this year um, and they'll be ongoing until December 31st. We also offer materials uh, and workshops for educators. We have K through 12 learning through legacy uh, workshop guides on our website. That's K through 12 and it's every, it, it's go across the curriculum. Um, those are free uh, to, to download from our website. We also offer educational materials. Um, one of our most popular things is our poster sets. We have 12 different posters, um, Alabama based. Everything from reptiles, trees, birds, butterflies, waterways. Um, and those are all available to citizens and teachers in Alabama. They're free of charge, but we do ask you to pay a small fee for the postage. You can find all of those as well on our website, um, in addition to our other um, environmental education programs and I mean publications like um, Healthy Home, Smart Driving, Drops and Watts. Um, and also we're funded through the sale of the uh, Alabama's Protect Our Environment license tag, which you can see in the background behind me. Um, when you purchase one of those, um, the extra $50 goes to fund legacy programs. So if you're interested, you can find out more on our website. Um, you can have that personalized for free too, um, whereas there's a charge to personalize uh, the state tag. So that's a bonus and it's tax deductible. So if you want more information, please visit our website or um, it's www.legacyenved.org. Um, if you have any further questions, you can get in touch with us after the program and we'll be glad to um, answer any questions you might have. Uh, today for the program is Reptiles of Alabama and we have Jimmy and Sierra Stiles who will be presenting the program. Um, see, hi, Jimmy and Sierra. Um, Sierra is our newest member of the Legacy Board of Directors. So um, I hope you'll enjoy the program and please be sure to give us some feedback um, at the conclusion. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jimmy and Sierra now. Thank you. Thank you all. Do you guys wanna explain what's going on in the picture or you, you wanna just get started with critters? Oh, the photo that's on the screen. Yeah, those are some of the uh, teacher workshops. Okay. Um, I believe the one on the left is at one of the uh, waterfalls in North Alabama. Um, I, David just left the room. He could better explain exactly what those work, what those details are than I can. But those are pictures of past teacher workshops. Okay. Well, very good. I'm going to stop sharing so Sierra and Jimmy can get full screen here. Okay. Um, 
Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Sierra Stiles and we are here live at Turtle Point Science Center. Um, to start off, I'd like to let you know that Turtle Point is in Wilmington, Alabama. We are about an hour north of Pensacola. Can everyone see? Okay, I think I think I think we're good. Um, <laughs> we're about an hour north of Pensacola and when it is not a COVID year, um, we, okay, sorry, I couldn't see my own screen for, for a minute. That was distracting me, but now I'm good. <laughs> um, Sierra, Sierra, if you're a uh, host, you can spotlight yourself for everyone so everyone can see you. Okay, awesome. Perfect. That sounds great. Okay, um, so um, Turtle Point Science Center is in Escambia County, Alabama. Uh, right on the Florida line. I, I literally go and have lunch in Florida um, almost every day, which is fun. Um, but we serve the uh, Scambia County school system and also the general public and other uh, city schools, other districts of schools. They come here to have kind of a hands-on live experience. Um, Turtle Point has got a large educational classroom, big live animal collection, butterfly garden and house. Um, we've got a boardwalk that goes to Big Escambia Creek, um, which is a beautiful creek. Uh, we've also got a wetland pond there. And basically we bring kids in, we give them a chance to see everything up close to get outdoors. And then we do some kind of a curriculum with them where we talk about uh, the different standards, um, science standard studies and help them kind of connect those to our local environment, as well as to the broader concepts that we're trying to teach in science. So what I'd like to do today, we decided that what would be nice um, is to kind of try to accent for the teachers, things that you can get students to look at with reptiles, with our local animals, that will get them thinking about all kinds of different science subjects. Um, the way that they're bodies and structures are connected to the function and also how we interact with that environment and some of the things that are going on in Alabama that are exciting and would be neat for your students to get involved with. So to start off, I'm gonna get Jimmy um, to give you kind of an overview of Alabama reptiles um, so that you can get kind of the quick and dirty full picture and then we'll get some of these animals out up close and get started on that. So here is Jimmy. All right, thanks for joining us, everybody. So uh, like Sierra said, we're gonna talk about reptiles today. And I guess it's kind of important to start off with, um, we kind of gotta know what a reptile is, right? Because, um, you know, we, we all can probably picture in our mind a reptile, you know, there's four different, uh, general kinds, you know, uh, alligators and, and crocodiles or your crocodilians, your turtles and snakes and lizards. Um, but uh, one of the things that I like to do with kids is to kind of focus on what makes a reptile a reptile. And um, so one of the things um, would be uh, not that one. Not that one. I don't know where one is. Insert. I'll bring it to you. Okay. So, there it is. There it is. All right. So, what makes a reptile a reptile? One thing uh, that we always talk about with uh, reptiles is that reptiles have some sort of outer, you know, covering that's hard, made out of uh, keratin like our fingernails, right? So, uh, you know, the, the perfect example is obviously a turtle shell, right? Um, and uh, that's kind of a classic reptile. reptile. Um, you know, characteristic is a, a shell or scales. And uh, a turtle shell is of course made of bone underneath, um, but it has scale, oh, there we go, has scales. Uh, covering the bone. So they do have scales covering them, right? Uh, but there are other animals that have shells, right? Like uh, this little guy here. Uh, I don't know if you can really see him that well, but we can all probably guess what this is. It's a hermit crab, right? It's got a shell, but is it a reptile? Obviously not, right? Um, it's an invertebrate. 
but you can, you know, relate to, uh, you know, school children. What is, uh, you know, a vertebrate versus invertebrate versus reptile helps with classification, uh, et cetera. So I'll just interject real quick and say, you know, these are two really simple props that teachers can come by really, really easy for the classroom, even if you can't come visit a science center. Um, you know, a lot of the cartoons that kids watch um, make them think that turtles can probably crawl out of their shells, just like hermit crabs do. But of course, we know that's not true. Um, a turtle has got all of its growth at each of these scutes, which is what we call the reptile scales. And that's the growth rates, yeah. And so they actually grow with the shell, the very middle of the scutes. You can kind of see here, all these rings, that's each year of growth coming out. So this turtle is as many years or seasons old as you see the rings on here. And that's not real accurate with a box turtle, which is what this is, but it is something that's more accurate as you get into say tortoises, which we'll talk about some. But one of the great things to show kids when you do this kind of invertebrate vertebrate thing is say, hey, what did we decide a vertebrate is? It's gotta have a backbone, right? Well, if you've got one of these shells, you can actually take it and show them, hey, look, this has got a backbone fused into its shell. So obviously, just like we can't crawl out of our shell, the uh, turtle can also not crawl out of its shell. And that gives it different needs and different protections. Um, of course, hermit crabs have actually got to walk around and find another shell that's appropriate to switch into. And that can be a little more difficult than just growing. Okay, I'm gonna back to Jimmy. <laughs> That's all right. All right. So um, another uh, group of creatures that people confuse with reptiles are amphibians, right? And if you notice, we got an amphibian here. Just grab the uh, red spotted newt. All right. But uh, what's different about amphibians versus reptiles, right? Amphibians like this newt have moist um, skin right, as opposed to shells or some sort of hard, scaly, uh, you know, outer covering. And, uh, and then I also like to go into, uh, and I don't have one right with me, um, but talk about fish, right? Fish versus reptiles and what makes a fish a fish, right? And that is obviously the use of gills. And then there's, of course, you know, amphibians that have gills, Right, but they're not fish nor reptiles. Um, so, anyway, um, so a little bit about Alabama reptiles. Uh, Alabama is an amazingly diverse place. One of the things that Sierra and I both like to uh, talk about um, is Alabama's amazing diversity. And we have a lot of diversity. We're number one uh, when it comes to things like um, aquatic animals. So uh, snails, mollusks, fish, uh, obviously reptiles. Uh, we have some aquatic reptiles, right? Such as uh, turtles. Alabama's number one for richness of turtle species in the world. Um, amphibians, frogs, and salamanders, we both we rank very highly on both of those. Um, so, uh, to be honest, uh, you know, I used to give a bunch of numbers to these uh, things, right? So, at, you know, I would say Alabama has 28 different species of turtles. Um, but cool thing about science is science is always changing. And uh, we're realizing uh, that we have a lot of what we call cryptic species. So species um, that are kind of hiding in plain sight as we uh, uncover uh, more about genetics and genetic diversity among species and what makes a species a species. We realize that we actually have lots of different species. To be quite honest, I'm not sure exactly in our state how many um, technical species we have, but I know 
Uh, it's close to um, close to 40, I believe now, uh, that are, are classified as species. And uh, we're developing new, or we're uh, realizing and describing new species uh, almost on a yearly basis, um, which is very exciting. And Alabama uh, is one of the places where that is occurring the most uh, as uh, geneticists and as scientists come to Alabama and start studying our reptiles, uh, we're realizing just how many different species we have. And um, it's pretty exciting. So um, one of the species, um, this guy right here, is one of our newest described species in the state of Alabama. This is an intermediate musk turtle right here. And uh, it lives only in uh, a few river drainages here in South Alabama, the Conecuh and uh, Perdido watersheds. Um, and uh, these guys are one of those cryptic species. They, they were considered to be uh, a common species called the loggerhead musk turtle for a long time until scientists came down and uh, did a detailed genetic analysis of the turtles of South Alabama. Uh, and so then we got the, the intermediate musk turtle, which is pretty awesome. Uh, again, endemic to uh, our lower coastal plain rivers. Um, this is another musk turtle called a uh, stink pot turtle. All right, so again, it's a musk turtle, right? And uh, both of these guys get their name because they secrete a musk or foul smelling <coughs> secretion. And one of the things that we said we'd talk about are adaptations and uh, different characteristics <coughs> and what they might tell us about a, an animal's habitat or their uh, behavior or biology, right? Well, <coughs> these guys are musk turtles. So uh, they, they, you know, obviously live in areas where there's going to be turtle predators, right? You wouldn't need to develop a, a foul smelling musk if you lived someplace um, where you weren't in constant danger of being eaten. <clears throat> and um, so that's what both of these creatures have done. Both of the turtles uh, will secrete, secrete the, uh, the musk when they get scared or disturbed. And um, that's a defense to help keep, uh, keep them from being eaten. Uh, some of their top predators are uh, things like alligators, um, you know, big fish could even eat them, uh, as well as um, <clears throat> raccoons, possums, foxes, coyotes, uh, all these sorts of creatures. And even uh, historically people ate a lot of musk turtles. Um, but um, so Alabama ranks incredibly high in turtle diversity. Uh, like I said, we, have, we are listed as number one in the world for turtle diversity. Um, and uh, I'll, that's based solely on our freshwater turtle uh, species uh, richness. But we also, of course, have lots of marine turtles and um, uh, we have five different species that uh, utilize the Alabama Gulf Coast uh, and um, uh, at some point or another in their life history use Alabama uh, and our coastal waters. Um, so that even increases our diversity more if you count those. Um, One small structure I want to point out before I put these guys up because you can see it so well right now is look here right under the chin. You're gonna see there's these two little white things yeah. hanging off of the chin. And this is a great thing to talk about with kids because most kids are aware of the function of things like whiskers on cats. And some of them are also aware of whiskers on catfish, okay? Um, well, these are called barbels and they actually do help these animals find food. They can kind of smell with these barbels. And also 
Yeah, they, they function also um, in them finding each other and using them in different ways. So they're strange little adaptations like that. Um, reptiles have got this. When you talk about amphibians, you find that salamanders have actually got little things called Siri, which are similar little chin, very, very similar. chin skin projections. And in the same way, they're used for mating, for fighting, for kind of communication in different ways. So, you know, one thing to think about as a teacher is, you know, how are these animals alike? How are they different when we compare everything like that? It gets, it's really pretty exciting to learn that some of the things that we thought maybe were just like unique to catfish, like whiskers and that function, you may find in other parts of the animal world that are adapted to things. And another thing we love to look at is things like feet. And I'm just gonna show you real quick before I put these up, some kind of up close feet, trying no, to. Notice the webbing in between the toes of this guy, right? They have... Here, you hold it. We'll kind of pull some feet out. You'll see they've also got claws as well as webbing and they don't love for you to touch them. And that's one thing uh, you'll notice we're holding these turtles from the back of the shell. They have really long necks that helps protect them and helps them catch pre uh, their prey as well because they can have their head scrunched up and just look like a rock and then all of a sudden just shoot their head out and grab you know a fish or a worm or uh, whatever they find because they're usually fairly opportunistic eaters. Um, but you can tell from the claws and the webbing that this turtle for sure can both dig and swim. And then you can talk about why those things would be important. You know, do turtles have to dig down and to hide from predators? Do the females have to dig to make nests, right? And you can try to get your students to come up with this, these things on their own, okay? Yeah, yeah. Another thing you can kind of point out, his feet out good now. is yeah, when you can see how this head is doing, you can imagine that it's pretty easy for this uh, animal to kind of pretend like it's a big scary snakehead or something. The head's so big on it, if it's coming out from a little opening, you might think this animal's a lot bigger than it is. Okay, I'm gonna go grab some more while Jimmy. Hey, while they're while while she's yeah. grabbing something, someone asked a question. Uh, said, "How do you tell the males from the females?" Uh, so that that is a great question. Um, on those aquatic turtles, uh, you actually have to uh, grab a hold of their tail, and um, it's basically. You kind of have to know what you're looking for, um, but it is the relation between the length of the tail, uh, the position of the cloaca, which is kind of the, you know, the out hole for everything, um, relative to the top of the carapace or the top of its shell. And... Um, um, you want a different one? Yeah. What is it? Uh, what are the aquatic turtles? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. And yep. Okay. Why don't we just bring that in there? Okay. All right. So instead of getting a, a whole bunch of uh, animals and bringing them to you, we're just going to take uh, all of you all to the turtles. Um, so let's see if this will work. Um, Switch it around. Okay. All right. We're going, we're going, we're going super live here into the, the live animal collection at Turtle Point. And um, so they had a question about um, how to tell the sex of the turtles apart. So let me get. Ah, uh, okay. <coughs> this one. So the tail of males from females, you have to look at the, the length of the, the tail. So males have longer tails um, and uh, the position of the cloaca. So that right there, relative to this shell on a male, 
will be further out. So this is a female uh, intermediate musk turtle. Okay, and just to show you real quick, in case you don't remember the whiskers on a catfish, there's some cool catfish whiskers. They're also called barbels. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and go over to this one. Okay. Okay, um, so this next turtle that we're gonna talk about is a very special turtle. Um, this is actually, um, an Alabama map turtle. And the Alabama map turtle, that's not an Alabama map turtle. I'm sorry, it's a barber's map turtle. <laughs> and it mated with an Alabama map turtle, which is what we're about to tell you about. So let me get to the, the good part here. Okay. Um, so, map turtles are one of our uh, river species of turtles. And Okay, and this one actually came from a citizen science project. Um, this turtle was trapped in the Cahaba River and it's actually endemic and unique only to the Choctawahatchee and Key Rivers in Alabama. So there is a group around Birmingham that is doing something called the Urban Turtle Project. And for that project, they're taking people Anyone who wants to go, students, the public, um, other just citizens um, out and they're trapping in a lot of the urban areas um, and also in the urban areas of the Cahaba River. And this individual was found in the Cahaba River and because there was a very talented researcher looking at it, he noticed that this did not look like the Alabama mat turtle that should be there. Um, Map turtle females, which this is, have got giant heads and they're specialized for eating mussels. Um, they've got those large jaws. The males are actually much, much smaller and they shift their diet as well. So they're not as specialized. They can eat more fish and different things like that. But this one is acting hungry and that's probably why it doesn't want to let me do its thing. But I wanted to show y'all on the back of this turtle. This is a tag that researchers use. If you can tell, it is yellow and there is a little hole drilled into the shell and through it, it's very much like a bird band. There's this small tag that actually has numbers on it that are unique to just this individual. So when this turtle was caught, they were planning to tag it and then release it and let it go. Um, but like I said, the researcher realized that it didn't look quite right. So they actually took it to UAB and um, did genetics work on it. They found out that it was definitely a barber's map turtle that should not be in the Cahaba. It was hundreds of miles from its home and we have no idea for how long. But the other thing that was really, really interesting about it is that it had eggs inside of it when they x-rayed it. So they ended up letting it lay the eggs. They induced, um, induced it to lay eggs um, by using uh, an oxytocin type thing. Um, and so it laid its eggs at UAB. And when they did the genetics on the eggs, it turned out that it was a true species hybrid, not just a subspecies where two things have crossed but where two full species have created an Alabama slash barber's map turtle hybrid. We assume that the um, offspring would not be fertile, but we don't know for sure. Um, it makes a great story for kids to understand because it gives us a chance to talk about why you can't let a turtle go in an area where it didn't come from. We get to talk about things like uh, polluting the gene pool and how that could affect the species, as well as bringing in um, different parasites and different disease problems that could affect local populations of turtles. So um, they decided that because this is actually a protected species in Alabama, um, it's state protected, so it's illegal to take these from the wild. Um, that it would be best off to become a teacher. And that's what happens sometimes to animals that have been taken away from their home. That's their best case scenario. 
Um, so this has been a really cool turtle. I want to show you real quick too what the babies look like because I've got one of those as well. But um, this is a real unique turtle where you can really look at how that massive head and that beak, you know, turtles have got a beak more like a bird really, it's not teeth. And they're very, very specialized. This thing can crack open clams and mussels um, and it just eats the meat and spits the shell right back out. And it's a really, really cool thing to watch, okay? Um, now I'm gonna bring you over and show you the offspring that we have. And this is a, this one is a year old. Oh, Lordy, oops. Okay, here we go. Now that I scared him real good. <laughs> um, all right, so this is the um, Barber's Alabama hybrid. And um, sorry about that. And it's got kind of characteristics of both. I scared it, so it's sticking its neck way, way in, which is pretty neat. It makes it look puckered even. Um, but you can see that these uh, map turtles, a lot of times the young and some of the species of adults have got these really cool little ridges on top. They're like cornified keratin. So it's a hard black projection. We've actually got a type of map turtle in the state called a black knob sawback where this stays in as an adult and it gets really, really big. And it makes them very, very pretty. Um, this one doesn't want to stick its head out now, but one of the ways you tell map turtle species apart is by looking at the beautiful markings on their head. They're unique on each turtle species and they tend to be a bright yellow or chartreuse green and uh, really look very, very cool. Um, These have also got a very attractive undershell and it's kind of just disappeared, but right here, you can kind of see they have kind of a belly button where the umbilical cord was attached. And you can see that on the skew for about a year and then it kind of disappears. Um, but each one of these skutes, it's S-C-U-T-E, is a modified scale that grows independently. And so the seams that you see between each shell are actually the growing regions. So they grow out from each center as they grow. And that's a, a really neat thing. This one you can tell has got some really cool kind of sharp projections on the back. And as you can imagine, that's a great uh, deterrent to predators to be able to have something pick it up and it has this kind of real sharp edges on it. Um, so cool beast, great swimmer. Um, they've got great camouflage and they tend to hang out um, on kind of on the edge of rocks. They like to bask in different rivers, things like that. Okay. Um, All right, now let's go. Do we want to do turtles or do we want to switch gears? And... Yeah, talk about snakes. Hmm? Yeah. All right. So we'll switch gears a little bit since uh, we're talking about reptiles as a whole. Don't want to spend too much of our time talking about um, turtles independently of all the other cool reptiles that exist out there. Um, we'll see if we can get. I was just going for, for the big cool. Yeah. For so the big this is fatty. pork chop that you're about to meet. So this, this snake is called pork chop. I think you're going to know why in a second. <laughs> Let's see if we can. Here, why don't we? All right. So, uh, so pork chop is a Florida king snake. And um, king snakes are very... Um, very cool species uh, that unfortunately are declining uh, like a lot of our reptile species. And uh, uh, Florida king snakes, eastern king snakes, um, uh, uh, all the species of uh, large king snakes like this 
are declining across their ranges and are now protected um, in the states they occur. Um, uh, with, in Alabama, we have the Eastern King Snake and um, we can show you one of those. Sure. Now, king snake is the one snake that we can usually get people to like because they are the ones that can eat other snakes. Now, this one that he's getting out is actually really mean, so you might you might get to see him, you know, with the less friendly snake. It may it may bite him in the head. I don't know. We'll see. But <laughs> this is this is what our uh, eastern king looks like. Uh, these are the ones that live in Alabama. And um, uh, these guys, like I said, are protected in Alabama. And uh, so it's now illegal to, uh, uh, to, you know, take them out of the wild or kill them or anything like that. Um, and uh, uh, like Sierra said, uh, they're a, a real easy sell for a lot of people. Um, especially when they're friendlier than the snake. Um, they're real easy sell because they eat other snakes. And um, so uh, one of the, or several of the species that they like to eat are uh, the pit vipers. So uh, copperheads, rattlesnakes, cottonmouths um, are one of their primary foods. And um, Snakes as a whole uh, are generally, you know, a, have a bad reputation, right? Um, but they're they're a really important part of our biodiversity, and uh, things like king snakes here are especially important because if um, these guys disappear, uh, it was recently uh, proven in a scientific paper. Um, that where these guys disappear, the uh, populations of these venomous snakes increase dramatically. So our actions on the world um, can have, you know, real consequences uh, for us, the conservation of, um, you know, these species, as well as our own public health, right? Uh, you know, uh, these guys are really important to us. And so we want to keep them around. Now, one, one question, Demi. Um, they were curious about how to tell a boy from a girl on a turtle. I oh, bet yeah. all kids and adults, I'm telling you, they always want to know what's up with the snake. Where are the boy and girl parts? What's going on? So, um, so remember, reptiles have all got a cloaca. Right? That's we, all in one. We talked, to, we talked about that with the turtles. It was... A little bit easier to see on turtles, but um, this snake has a cloaca. It's right there in between these scales, right? And so to tell um, the sex of a snake, you actually have to probe their cloaca, um, which they're not real fond of, and we're not going to do with this one right now. Um, you know, if you're if you're really good, and you're you know nerdy herpetology. Uh, herpetologist type like Sierra and I, um, you can uh, sometimes tell by the length of the tail uh, relative to the rest of the body, uh, but that's a, a pretty, uh, it's a 50-50 shot. There's a learning you, curve. Actually get it right, but the only way to truly tell is uh, to either probe them or to x-ray them because all their reproductive parts are tucked nicely inside there. Um, um, another structural thing you should mention is about snakes' lungs. Yeah, so um, one structural thing about snakes is um, snakes have a really long body, right? They're really long creatures. They don't have any legs. So all the parts of their body are, are you know, uh, fit into this big long tube, right? Um, same with their lungs. So a snake actually has two different sized lungs. They have uh, one that's, uh, uh, you know, relatively short would come to about here um, on the snake. 
maybe it's more right in there relative. And then they have one really long lung that'll come, you know, almost halfway down uh, or a little over halfway down the body, the length of the body. Um, so they're pretty interesting that they, you know, uh, and they did that to conserve space inside this long body. Now, snakes don't have legs, right? We all know that. Um, so one of the, the things I like to talk about is why would a snake not have legs? Why does a snake need legs? Uh, why would a snake need legs? Um, and, you know, why, why did they evolve to not have legs? And, um, oh yeah, we're going to. Um, so snakes don't have legs because snakes um, are often what we call fossorial animals. They live underground. Uh, a lot of the time. And legs and appendages coming off you simply are things to get in the way of being able to uh, to crawl underground and to move through holes and burrows and things like that, right? So, um, you know, not having legs is very advantageous to them. Uh, and it allows them to not only, you know, move across the land on, on, above ground, but allows them to very efficiently move underground as well. So let's go take a look at um, this other creature. Here's the other creature. There. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so, see where this guy is. Um, so, as you can see, this guy is, well, spending a lot of time underground. So let's see if we can get it to come out from underneath the ground. Well, there we go. Hey, Wiggler. <laughs> Whoa there. Um, let's see if we can get Wiggle, the Wiggle creature. Now we'll give you a hint as to what this is because he's trying to get it gently so that it won't break its tail off. So I'll just so, let you think about that for a minute. So snakes don't break their tail, but lizards do. And this is a lizard. We're just gonna take that. <laughs> it's being very cantankerous. Come here. I'm not sure that's something. <laughs> okay. Make it safe. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, All right. right. So this is a lizard or legless lizard, glass or glass lizard. And as the name implies, um, they don't have legs. Now you might think, well, what's the difference between that and a snake? Well, there's a few key differences. One, Lizards have ears. They have external ear openings. And we'll see, you might be able to see on this guy, right there behind his jaw, there's a little opening. Um, right there. There we go. Right there behind his ears, there's an external ear. And that external ear, um, allows them to hear sounds uh, similar to us. I mean, at different frequencies and obviously not quite like us, but um, they can hear noises, um, which is different from a snake, which does not hear uh, noises. Um, they work on vibrations only. So uh, another thing- Oh, that, there was a good shot of the ear. There we go, yeah. right there. Yeah. So another thing that lizards have that snakes don't is external eyelids. So they can close their eyes, right? Um, but again, this guy's a legless lizard. Um, why is he legless? So he can move very efficiently uh, under the soil and through. Not sure what happened there. Let me see if uh, 
maybe they push the button, <laughs> the disconnect button. It looks like they have gone offline. Let's uh, give them a second to see if they come back. I know those buttons are awful close together if they're using a phone for shooting video. David, would you like uh, somebody from my office to try to text or call? Yes, please. Okay, I, I'll be right. I'll be right back. I just text. I just text. Uh, you okay. Here. Thank you. you mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I'm finding some things we can do in the classroom. Get some scenarios with the the map turtle and teach uh, genetics and speciation. So we can see that right here in our state of Alabama. So I'm excited about that. Hope we can do a lesson similar to that to incorporate some genetics into that. Yeah, it looks like they're coming back. Hey everybody, sorry about that. A little technical <laughs> difficulties there. Uh, the iPad died for some reason. So um, anyway, we're gonna get back to it. Um, there we go. We're on. All right. So, um, well, I think lizards, right, um, and in particular legless lizards, evolved um, independently of from snakes uh, to have uh, to 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 basically lose their legs to allow them to be more fossorial and be able to. Um, you know, navigate underground um, and uh, through really dense grasses and things like that. Whereas, uh, obviously, there are a lot of lizards that have legs, right? Um, and uh, let's take a look at one of those cuties. Um, this guy's super cute, right? Uh, and this guy definitely has legs, right? And, and um, So about the, the behavior of these two creatures, right? Uh, this guy spends a lot of time, the leopard gecko here spends a lot of time climbing, right? So it has very well-developed legs with very well-developed toes that are able to grip, um, you know, things uh, and allow them to climb very well, right? So these guys obviously spend a lot more time above ground, um, and, uh, and even literally above ground, right? Climbing and things like that, then the legless lizard. Um, so- uh, and, and one of the things we'll point out as teachers here is of course, a leopard gecko is not an Alabama reptile, but you saw how difficult it is to handle the legless lizards. Well, our leg lizards, some of them are so fast that you can't even catch them, okay? So let a kid look at them. So a lot of times it's better to show the kids, the lizards out in nature and something like this animal, which is very easy classroom pet to keep, can be a great way for them to learn a little more about some of these structures um, like the eyelids. Um, here, touch the... So it's easy to see, you know, eyes. that um, these things will actually sleep and the kids will see them sleeping with their eyes closed. and. You can learn a lot by looking at them about animals. So, you know, we love native animals, but we also recognize that um, as teachers, we need to choose the best, the best possible animal to get the concept across. And a lot of times that means calling on all of our resources. Um, I know one that we can't stand not to show you real quick is this special animal. Um, that also connects to another citizen science story. And so I'm going to take the camera off me and put it on this guy. Okay. This is a really awesome turtle called uh, Diamondback Terrapin. So this is the, a full grown adult and it's, uh, it's about hand sized. It's not real, real big. They don't get real huge. Um, they are a protected species. They were over collected for the food industry a long time ago and they made Campbell's soup out of them. Um, but they put in a lot of different research things to try to figure out how to help these turtles and what was going wrong with them. 
after they stopped allowing the big Campbell soup industry to do that. Um, this is an excellent species to show the beak on because you can tell what a bony beak that is. I mean, if you can imagine taking that thing off and putting it on a bird, it's easy to picture um, that happening. Um, but um, what we've uh, found out about diamondback terrapins through studying their conservation problem, again, um, a lot of times it just requires thinking of a solution. Um, and kids are wonderful at doing that. Um, basically, they found out that all of these turtles were drowning in crab traps because the crab traps in the bays where these turtles live, they're a brackish water animal, which means they live in a mix of salty and fresh water. Um, so they're in the bays, kind of where the rivers meet the bay. Um, and they nest on those areas. Um, Dolphin Island has a nice population of these in Alabama that studied. But what they figured out is that all they really had to do to keep the turtles from drowning in the crab traps was add some tiny little device that's called a TED or a turtle exclusion device. Well, I need to get one for here, but you've all seen one if you've seen a crab trap anytime in the past 10 years. Um, they are basically a plastic circle that goes on the crab trap. And that is there because it doesn't let uh, the commercial sized crabs out of the trap, but it does allow these turtles to get out. So that's a really special thing. And, um, you know, in Alabama, it was students that actually nominated um, the Alabama red bellied turtle as our state turtle. Um, a lot of times when students are allowed to think about solutions and understand things, they, they will blow your mind. So it's great to get them in on some of these real stories. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to Jimmy now. Can you see me? Oh, not yet. Nope. Oh, I'm wrong nope. way. Here um, we go. Well, we okay. To explore our uh, state's final reptile group. Let's see if we can see those. Oh, <laughs> they are feisty. We said we were going to have some live action, right? So here we go. Jimmy Alligator. Man, jeez. Yeah, these are a little spoiled and big and yeah. feisty. Um, and feisty. So. We got one last group of reptiles. Hey, stop it. They do hiss sometimes. They do hiss. All right. <laughs> and uh, these are our alligators, right? In Alabama, we don't have crocodiles. Uh, the American crocodile only lives in Florida. <clears throat> but we do have alligators. And alligators are an amazing conservation success story, right? Because alligators were actually on the endangered species list for quite a while. And, uh, uh, but they've, they've since recovered their populations dramatically. And uh, they're now found in more parts of Alabama than maybe ever in the historical past. Um, but they're amazing creatures. Um, they've been around a very long time, which has allowed them to develop some cool characteristics, right? Um, one of which is... Okay. If you can see it, uh, they have double eyelids, right? You have, have to look real quick. They have the main eyelid like you and I have, but they also have what's called a nictitating membrane or a little membrane that comes across their eyes. Like a windshield wiper. Like, kind of like a windshield wiper or like uh, instant goggles, right? Uh, alligators spend a lot of time underwater and uh, uh, water can irritate our eyeballs, right? Anybody that's gone swimming in the ocean and open their eyes um, knows that, you know, water can be an irritant. So alligators will often use their nictitating membrane uh, to be able to still see while they're swimming underwater, um, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And uh, uh, alligators are just a very special creature um uh, they you know uh 
have another cool adaptation, which is their, their claws. So all, alligators have um, weird, weird feet. And um, uh, they actually have three claws. They have five digits on their front foot and four on their back, not all of which actually have claws, uh, but that allows them to be very efficient diggers uh, as well as swimmers. And a cool thing is that uh, lack of claws allows you to identify uh, alligator tracks very well if you see them in the sand. And, um, uh, but a cool thing about alligators is um, alligators are, have really impressive immune systems. So they're allowed to, uh, or not they're allowed, but they are able to uh, fight off a lot of bacteria because they live in some pretty swampy, dirty, gross places, right? Uh, and so by having a really good enhanced immune system in their blood, it allows them to ward off infections very well. And in fact, uh, there's applications to humans. Um, we are studying um, how alligators are able to do this in the hopes that we can enhance our own medical abilities and our own immune systems. Um, but I know we're, we're almost out of time. So I do want to allow for a, you know, a couple questions. They want to see it go back in. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. Well, you definitely want to see it go back in. See if it, see if it bites me. Turn it, turn it back. This is the fun part, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're about out of time, but um, I can't help but just as we're closing and asking, que answering questions, showing you this awesome gopher tortoise. Um, if you have not studied the gopher tortoise, this is the animal to learn about. And, uh, you know, a cool thing to kind of wrap up talking about uh, conservation and citizen science is uh, April 10th, uh, which was just recently, was Gopher Tortoise Day. It was a, uh, it's a state proclamated holiday that celebrates the, the gopher tortoises and their conservation. Um, so uh, if you wanna learn more about gopher tortoises, um, a great way to, to do that is uh, just Google Gopher Tortoise Day, Alabama, and it's got all kinds of uh, cool videos and all kinds of interesting facts about it. Yeah, it's a great way to easily host an event for your students. Um, and please come see us at Turtle Point and feel free to um, contact us later with questions or send them to the moderators and we'd be happy to get back to you. Thanks everybody and we sure do appreciate it. Thanks, Jimmy and Sierra. I think everyone really enjoyed that. I know I did. I learned a lot today. Awesome. Fun. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions in the uh, in the chat box, but everybody was impressed. Um, and those are lots of fun critters that y'all have. Well, thank you. Um, uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> They're only part of the day's difficulties that you know about, but you know, our day's gotten a lot better since then. So, <laughs> well, very does anybody good. have any questions, real quick? Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending today. Oh, um, do we have an Eastern Indigo snake? We do. Well, we can share it real quick. For the one who asked, yes, we do. Um, don't get it out too much because it has just eaten a lot and we don't want it to throw up. I mean, but I will I will get yeah, the well, camera up on it for you. Yes, we do. So this one is a male. Um, it was a runt and it's a captive and that's why we are able to have it. And it has just moved here to Turtle like, Point. He's gonna think that. Yeah, he likes to eat. So he's thinking about eating Denny's finger, yeah. but um, this is also uh, at Turtle Point now. So if anyone wants to come see it sometime after we get open, um, we're looking forward to that.
Okay, well, thanks again. And thanks to everyone um, who tuned in to the program this afternoon. And we hope to see y'all again in the future. Great, thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you.